Hi, this is E. David Crawford again, uh, and joining me in this edition of Grand Rounds in Neurology, Point Counterpoint, is Dr. Neil Stone from New York and Mount Sinai. Neil's a great friend. We've uh, worked together over the years in many projects, uh, going way back to early prostate cancer, hormone therapy, brachytherapy, and, and now on this whole topic of interrogating the prostate, you know, and about every cancer that we treat, we stage it. We stage it with PET scans. We use CTs and lymph node biopsies and much, many other things, uh, bone scans. But in prostate, localized disease, those things don't help, at least for now. We want to know what's going on in the gland. And we sort of make very difficult decisions on random transrectal biopsies. We've certainly got a lot of help from, from uh, uh, MRIs. Uh, but probably one of the more definitive ways to do it is this whole concept of, of mapping biopsies or 3D biopsies. And no one has uh, spent more time doing this than Neil Stone. And uh, for that reason, I'm asking him to present sort of the, the counterpoint here on the role of mapping biopsies compared to MRI. Neil? Thank you. Uh, my challenge and task today is to talk to you about the role of mapping biopsies and MRI in the diagnosis and patient selection and eventually treatment of men with prostate cancer utilizing focal ablation. Now, we do 1.2 million prostate biopsy, biopsies a year in the U.S. and 3.4 million worldwide, and we diagnose 180,000 new cases of prostate cancer, but the majority of biopsies are done by the transrectal route. That's 95%, and only 5% are done by the transperineal route mostly because it requires an OR and it's an inconvenient procedure to do today, given the current technology. It's interesting to note that both transrectal ultrasound biopsy and transperineal biopsy were introduced at about the same time in the late 1980s, the transrectal route by uh, Dr. Fred Lee and the transperineal route by uh, Guy Valenciennes. And we all know that the transperineal route was not adopted by most clinicians today. So this technique, whether it's transrectal or transperineal, is really relying on 30-year-old technology. The spring-loaded ultrasound-guided devices have not substantially changed in almost 30 years. I like this study. Uh, this is a French study that looked at uh, over 10,000 men who had radical prostatectomies. And they were trying to use transrectal biopsy information and trying to determine whether low-risk men, these were really low-risk men. There were 919 men in this cohort that had T1C disease, PSA under 10, and only one core out of the 12 positive with a very short length of prostate cancer, and all were Gleason 6. So one would consider this to be the ideal patient population for active surveillance. And when these 919 men had prostatectomy, only about 26% of them had insignificant tumors. So the take home message here was that the standard truss biopsy does not adequately identify men for active surveillance, even though that's what the gold standard is today. The other problem with a truss biopsy is because of the frequent use of fluoroquinolones, we've seen an increased amount of fluoroquinolone-resistant bacteria and associated infections with the truss biopsy. So the study from NAM has demonstrated that both the uh, truss infections and overall complication rates have increased substantially since the early 2000s from around 1% to almost 4%. And if we do a MRI fusion-guided biopsy, unless the practitioner takes uh, precautions specifically against infections, the infection rate and the new fusion biopsies by trust are going to be the same as they are without the MRI guidance. So the bottom line with trust biopsy is only 20 to 20, 25 to 30% are positive. It really should be closer to 50%. 25 to 30% need repeating because of false negatives. We need to take extra precautions to prevent serious infections. It's got limited usefulness for selecting active surveillance candidates. 
It can't be used for selecting patients for focal therapy because you get no localization information. But we also have to recognize it's hard to change practice patterns because it's a quick and easy, easily performed procedure. So it's no wonder that the preventative task force doesn't like PSA, but it's really not the PSA that's the problem. It's really the biopsy. So is there a better solution? Dr. Laporte talked to you about MRI. I'm gonna talk a little bit about MRI also, but I'm gonna focus more on how we need to change the transperineal approach so it really serves our purpose, which is to identify correctly who needs definitive therapy, who are candidates for focal therapy, and who could be safely observed. So uh, Dr. Lepore mentioned uh, one of the publications that came out of UCLA, and I wanna go over a couple other ones. So this was an MRI uh, biopsy detected patients who had prostatectomy, and if the patient had a very large lesion, let's say more than three centimeters, and the MRI detected it, and it was a solitary tumor, it was right 100% of the time. So there's no question when a patient has a large PIRAD four or five lesion, that cancer is most, that uh, lesion is most likely going to be a prostate cancer. And the MRI with a fusion biopsy works really well. But that's not the majority of the lesions. The ma majority of lesions are small, multifocal cancers. And, and this study, when one considers lesions smaller than 0.5 centimeters in length, MRI missed 89% of those lesions. And if one's just looking at high-grade lesions, the Gleason 3 plus 4s and above, when we're again talking about multifocal disease, MRI missed between 29 and 38% of the cancers. So the bottom line here is MRI misses 73 group. That's the group that just published the PROMISE study. So what they did is they did MRIs, they found the lesion, they then gave the patients HIFU, 56 men, and either they did a hemiablation up here in A, or they did a partial gland ablation on one side. And then following this, they brought the patients back and they did biopsies six months later. And lo and behold, they found that 42.3% of the men had a positive biopsy. Either it was an infield biopsy or it was an out of field biopsy. This just goes to prove that MRI use, utilized to choose patients for focal therapy is probably not the best thing that we should be doing. Here's another paper from UCLA, and this one came out recently. And the purpose of this paper is they did whole mouth. Over here in red on the left, you see the cancers circumscribed in the red ink. And then to the right, you see the MRIs, and the cancers were circumscribed in green. And then they overlaid the two. So they did a co-registration, and you could see the mismatch on the bigger lesion and on the smaller lesion. And on the right, you see a graph that gives you the median mismatch was 1.35 centimeters. So not only does MRI not find all the lesions, MRI also doesn't tell you the size of the lesion adequately. So you don't know how big to make the ablation field. So is, there, is transperineal mapping biopsy a better solution? So the Initial advocates for mapping biopsy, Dr. Gary Onick, who is a radiologist, and Dr. Winston Barzell, who is a, is a urologist, published this seminal paper almost 10 years ago where they did transperineal mapping biopsies, taking a biopsy every five millimeters in 110 men with unilateral prostate cancer that were being considered for active surveillance. They took a medium of 46 scores, and they found bilateral disease in more than half and Gleason score upgrading in almost a quarter of the patients. So this is not new. Dr. Lepore mentioned it, but this is not something, as Dr. Lepore says, you want to do in every patient, and that's something I agree with. So who should have it done, and how should it best be done? And here's a, an example of a urologist doing a transperineal biopsy using a uh, template we typically use for brachytherapy. The patient is in the same position for brachytherapy. He's putting the biopsy device through the grid. He's looking at the ultrasound screen. You can see on the right the white needle coming in from the perineum and puncturing the prostate. So that's how the procedure is done. But we have to recognize that this procedure is handicapped and limited. 
the biopsy needle only takes a 20 millimeter specimen. So if you're trying to span the length of a prostate that's five centimeters long, you need to take three inline biopsies. There is no mechanism to develop a comprehensive biopsy plan, and there's no record of where the lesions, the biopsies are and where the positive lesions are. So if you're taking 50, 60, I've taken as many as 100 biopsies on a large patient, a large prostate, uh, and I don't have a record of where those cancers are. Yes, I know what grid point they went through, but since the prostate is a moving target, I don't have the fine information that would guide me back to those lesions if they're positive. And there's another issue, there's a pathological problem. I have no way to secure the specimen, so when it gets to the pathologist, it's he, can, he or she can look at it and tell me where the cancer is on that core, because most of the time, specimens are fragmented, and by the time they get to the lab, they're in many pieces. So unless you solve all of these problems, this is not going to be a procedure that's going to be widely accepted, and it's not going to be a successful procedure. So a number of years ago, Dr. Crawford and I assembled a group of interested individuals, pathologists, radiologists, software engineers, and we decided we wanted to try and tackle all these issues to see if we could come up with a comprehensive strategy. So the first thing we did was we took a look at a paper written by Kepner and Kepner. What they said was, if you drill parallel holes in the prostate and you space those holes a certain distance apart, you could define the likelihood of finding a tumor that you wouldn't biopsy uh, with uh, needles. So what that amounts to, if you do the math, is if you use a 15-gauge needle and you space the biopsy needles five millimeters apart, then you could detect a lesion as small as 0.1 cc's. So this is probably, my estimation, at least five to 10 times more sensitive than MRI. But they're having this in an article and a theory is fine, but putting it into practice is very different. So next thing we did is we wrote a software program back in 2012 and we tested it for a couple of years. And what you're seeing here is an ultrasound image, very similar to brachytherapy uh, software. The biopsy sites are five millimeters apart. This bright, bright uh, light is uh, the first biopsy you would take, and you'd follow the biopsy plan. And instead of just looking at the image down here below where you see the biopsy needle coming in and the prostate there on sagittal, you actually have the digital over overlay on this upper screen showing the prostate and the virtual needle coming in with the actual needle. So that gave you a means of recording your biopsy positions and being able to utilize that information after when you got the report. And here's a patient of Dr. Crawford's actually. He came in with one positive core on trust. He went through the mapping and we found eight lesions, four were Gleason six and four were Gleason seven, which is typically what you find with transperineal. But now we had a, a mechanism to know where the lesions are. And we then went forward and we built the second program. This is a test in a phantom, this is not in a patient. And I built this program, or we built this program so it could be easily utilized by urologists. So one of the things I mentioned before is we don't know the size of the lesion, so we don't know the ablation field. So this simulation shows three positive lesions in three needles. But you see the needles around in blue, and you don't really know how big those lesions are because we don't have any information other than the length of the lesion and the z-axis. But I put what I did is I put a slide tool in. And what the slide tool does is it grows the theoretical size of the lesion out to the negative, next negative biopsy. So if you see in the lower uh, right of your screen or the lower left of the prostate, again, this is a phantom, these needles surrounding it had no cancer in them. The needle in the middle, the red, had the cancer. So in theory, the cancer could be as large as the next negative needle. So in essence, this defines the zone of ablation one would need to have if a needle was positive using this technique. So then we had to tackle another issue. This is a representation of a real pr prostate of a patient getting a biopsy. Here's the virtual needle in yellow. And here you see the white it represents the needle that came in and took the biopsy. And you see there is a substantial deflection. 
So our current needles are not really use, util, utilizable because of a deflection issue and the ability to record where the needle goes. So we had to figure out how to change that, and we did. We came up with a new needle tip design, and when one looks at the deflection of the new needle, and this was tested in a hydrogel that simulates prostate, the typical needle we use, called the bar needle, could be any number of needles, had a mean deflection of zero of 1.9 degrees, and the new trocar tip needle had a deflection of 1.1 to 0.2 degrees. So it was about one ninth to one twentieth of deflection of current needles. So that had happened just by changing the design of the tip of the needle. The next thing is we needed to come up with a, a device to shoot the needle that could vary the length of the shot based on the length of the gland. So we don't want to be sticking the needle in the prostate and taking three 20 millimeter biopsies because it takes too long, number one. And number two, every time you put the needle in the patient, the needle never ends up exactly in the same place. So we came up with this new device that allows you to vary the depth of the core between 20 millimeters and 60 millimeters, which would cover just about all the prostate. And here's some testing that we did in cadavers. Here's a bar needle, and there's the length of the throw. So that shows you you're only going to get that piece of prostate. And here's the variable needle showing you that you can actually take a biopsy from apex to the top of the base. In this case, this was a form centimeter biopsy. Then the next challenge was to change the core bed. So you know from using our standard needles, when the cannula comes over the beginning of the notch, the tissue gets pushed to the far end, and you don't usually get a full-length core. It's exactly the um, average length of a specimen is about 60% of the designated length. So a two centimeter core bed usually takes about uh, 1.2 uh, centimeters. So we hypothesized by putting these ridges in that the tissue would be held in place, and that's exactly what happened. This is testing in porcine kidney, showing that you get a nice robust core that functions all the way from the beginning to the end of the core bed, depending on the length you dial between 20 and 60 millimeters. So here's, a, here's an example of using a simulation and a hole mount is a lesion in the posterior. We, we take a biopsy with our standard uh, needle. It's 20 millimeters. We diagnose a Gleason 6. We miss the big Gleason 8 up top. By using the new needle, in theory, you could take a biopsy that would cover the posterior and the anterior, getting those cancers that only appear in the anterior, which, by the way, today is 25 to 30 percent of patients who present with uh, risk for prostate cancer only have cancers in the interior of the gland. So with this approach, using it as a truss biopsy, you might be able to diagnose many more of those anterior cancers and reduce that 25 to 30 percent of men who need to come back for repeat biopsies because of an initial false negative. Lastly, as I said, we need to figure out how to better um, manage the specimen. So this is a typical mapping biopsy case. You know, usually pick up the needle with uh, the pick up the specimen with a needle, as you see here, and you drop it into a vial of formalin. With the newly designed device we have, we have a carrier that's a woven polyester fiber. The specimen gets placed in this carrier. The carrier gets closed, and then the carrier is put in formalin. When the carrier gets to the lab, the base end is inked and the apex end is inked. Because the carrier is six centimeters long, it is cut in half, so the two halves are placed in the tissue processing cassette. The specimen is never handled. The, the specimen goes through all phases of processing. Here you see it being uh, sectioned on the microtome. There's the microtome blade. Here's the carrier. You can barely make that out. It's not stained. There's the specimen. The, the uh, carrier with specimen gets stained, puts on the slide, and is red. And you can see here that it stays intact. So that accomplishes the third portion, the first portion being the mapping, the second portion being the variable needle and actuator, and the third portion being a device to secure the specimen. So when the pathologist gets it, he can tell us, Here's the base on the right. There's the apex on the left. The cancer starts one centimeter from the base. 
It goes for one sonometer, and then that report is uploaded to the software, and then the software is then utilized for treatment planning because it has a representation of where the lesion is and how large the lesion is. So this is the algorithm that I envision. Of course, we can't do this today because these devices are not available. But with a new truss biopsy needle, if the biopsy is down negative, utilizing the variable length needle, and the patient is still has a suspicion of prostate cancer, I think that's a good candidate for MRI. If the MRI is positive, then he gets a targeted biopsy. So then you're done. If the patient has a Gleason 6, that would be a candidate for active surveillance, or the patient has a negative MRI, because now MRI is missing those smaller multifocal lesions, then that's the patient that should undergo 3D mapping. If With a 3D mapping, as I envision, and that patient has Gleason 6 disease, we're no longer to be doing active surveillance. We're going to be doing accurate surveillance. And the reason why it's accurate surveillance is because we've defined Gleason 6 in men with lesions as small as 0.1 cubic centimeters. Those men probably don't need another biopsy or even another PSA for at least five years. And that is going to be something like colonoscopy. So we're actually going to be practicing very uh, value-based medicine because we don't need to see that patient back. On the other hand, if that patient has a Gleason 8 to 10, we've now found Gleason 8 to 10 as small as 0.1 cubic centimeters. And radical prostatectomy or radiation can actually probably cure those patients, whereas now 40% of men with Gleason 8 to 10 fail. And the reason they fail is because they're found with lesions that are too large. And then we have the group in the middle. And the group in the middle probably represents one-third of men with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. These are the men that can have targeted focal therapy and will be able to get at all of the small lesions, not just some of them, because we will have identified them and we will have a, a image that we can marry to any type of treatment focal therapy platform we want and be able to target the individual discrete lesions. So in summary, a real-time three-dimensional approach utilizing software, newly just uh, design needles and actuators, and a pathology carrier system has the capability of detecting lesions as small as 0.1 centimeters. Targeted focal therapy requires precise location of all significant lesions and then a roadmap for treatment planning. The jury is out as to whether some or all the lesions to be, need to be treated, and perhaps that's where some of these markers come in and can help us make that decision. But the proof of success still needs to be determined. These are these are uh, not approved devices. They need to be tested, and we need to learn from them. And we need to learn whether a lesion eradication can really be done. So once we have the roadmap, we can get to the lesions, but we still need to prove that we can eradicate them all with follow-up biopsies. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, very interesting. I don't think there's any question that this uh, – 3D mapping biopsy, uh, I, I often call it a needle prostatectomy, is, is extremely accurate. I, th I think Dr. Lepore, though, made a, the point that uh, we may not need to be that accurate in a lot of uh, patients and may not need to go to these extremes. So uh, let's uh, have Dr. Lepore make some comments here or, or uh, set up a little point-counterpoint debate with you. So no, listen. So 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 Nelson, congratulations. Listen, I think you've taken uh, the uh, transperineal mapping biopsy, uh, which I think historically has been cumbersome and uh, and and fairly crude, and and, and really uh, you're making it uh, a fairly elegant process. I think the real thing that I think is important. Um, and if we're going to talk about sort of focal therapy uh, and the ability to identify disease, then I think we really have to come away from the UCLA uh, uh, data because that's taking candidates for radical prostatectomy. And remember, you know, 80, 90 percent of those cases uh, are not candidates for focal ablation. Now, in fairness, uh, our paper was just uh, accepted for publication. So I think that really needs to be the standard uh, for judging MRI uh, fusion target biopsy 
as far as finding significant disease. Now, remember, uh, again, unlike the UCLA study, and remember the, the, the image that you showed showed these two very large uh, bilateral lesions. Those are not candidates for a focal uh, ablation. Now, if we look at candidates for focal ablation, again, we have 20% that will have extra focal uh, pattern for, but remember, uh, even looking at uh, your uh, data, you know, sort of your threshold for detecting a lesion is is 0 0.1 uh, millimeter, uh, and really the pattern for that we miss is uh, is really 0.8 millimeters. So again, I think many of the pattern fours uh, that we may be missing, uh, it's possible the technology. Uh, that you're proposing uh, may miss some of those. And then finally, remember when we talk, talked about value-based medicine, there's a value to the detection. And then we also have to look at cost and morbidity, which is something that uh, I think was lacking um, in the, um, you know, in, 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 in your presentation. But my only comment would be is that we're judging uh, the ability of the MRI and fusion biopsy in candidates for focal ablation. And that's why I believe the paper uh, that will soon be published sort of addresses that, that, that cohort. But again, I think there are definitely uh, candidates for the uh, the mapping biopsy. Certainly, if you don't have access to uh, uh, to high quality uh, imaging, uh, but uh, I think the work the, the, that you, together with Dave, uh, that that which uh, again you you presented uh, this evening, I, I think it's elegant, uh, and I think it uh, may make. Uh, the trans uh, uh, perineal mapping biopsy uh, uh, more reliable, and then I think the question is really going to be who. So at so at what for who's the candidate that we need that precise of a map, and then it comes down to you know if you really do have 0.8 millimeters of 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 uh, pattern four in this whole prostate. Uh, and that I do believe that in those cases, uh, it's safe to follow uh, those patients, uh, assuming, uh, and again, the jury is still out, we're assuming for this presentation that we're actually ablating, successfully ablating uh, the lesion. And the reason why we do a, a 10 millimeter target was pretty much the data from Samir. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the other option is to just do the, the, the hemiablation, which then minimizes the precision of, your, uh, of, of the targeting. But again, uh, I think the work you've shown tonight is, is, is elegant and, and is going to set sort of a new standard uh, for performing a mapping biopsy. And the question will be who, who and when. And thank you, Herb. That was excellent. Um, let's be clear. What I show, what I showed uh, on this presentation is not available. It's not FDA cleared, so nobody can do it. And you can't compare it to MRI or prostatectomy because it's not available. It will become available, and when it does become available, then we can start making comments. How does it compare to MRI uh, or transrectal biopsy? Is it cost effective? These are all hypotheses, so I agree. And you can't do that. So today, you can do MRI and in a high quality facility like at yours at NYU with Dr. Tanasia, you certainly can get excellent information that helps guide uh, your treatment choice, whether it be definitive therapy, surveillance, or focal therapy. So as an intermediate step, I think we're in a good position. As a final step, I would not agree that we're in a good position. And I think I pointed out why we're not. Let's also not, let's also be clear on some nomenclature. When I said 0 0.1 cc's, I'm talking about a, a mathematical ability. And that mathematical ability relates to the fact that the diameter of a 15 gauge needle, which is what I'm proposing, is one and a half millimeters. So if you have a, a tissue, you're removing that's one and a half millimeters 
and the next needle over is five millimeters away, then the dead space, if you will, is three and a half millimeters. So if you took three and a half millimeters in the X plane, three and a half millimeters in the Y plane, and then three and a half millimeters in the Z plane, keep in mind that you're getting all of the tumor in the Z plane because your needle is going from one end of the prostate to the other, then three and a half millimeters cubed is 0 0.4 cubic centimeters. So let's say it's less than 0 0.1 cubic centimeters. When you're doing an MRI, you don't have volume information. You have, you have volume information from the MRI, but you don't have it from the biopsy. So you have a linear biopsy. So what we describe on MRI is maximum core length or total core length of the tumor. So you've got that in the, in the, basically in the Z plane only. You don't have it in the X or Y. You just have the MRI. So we don't typically talk about volumes of tumor based on biopsies, uh, transrectal biopsies and MRI. We usually talk about linear lengths. Now converting that to a volume, that's a different kettle of fish. So that has not been accurate. And it's hard to know uh, what your target would be on an MRI because you don't have that information other than what's on the MRI. And that's never been demonstrated in a study that you could take a truss biopsy doing a fusion approach and then translate the truss biopsy linear information into an MRI volume. So you're still left with that MRI inaccuracy. So that remains to be a problem. It's a problem for mapping too, but I propose a solution based on the collateral parallel needles that would have no tumor in them. But it's still, Herb, it still needs to be proven. It's, it's not there yet. No, and maybe just to clarify, because in fact, when we talked about that 0.1 millimeter, that actually was in the radical prostatectomy specimen. So not from the MRI, because our resolution is probably to see something on the MRI is probably about, you know, five millimeters. But in fact, uh, those, uh, when we talked about the tumors that we missed in terms of their um, their uh, measurement, that was like on, on the average uh, was a five millimeter lesion that was three plus four, but the component that was actually uh, four, uh, pattern four was uh, a fraction of a millimeter, which would be, I think, in men, not all, but in most cases, uh, so in 80% of the, the, the time, uh, we don't leave any pattern for at least as good as our step sections uh, are. But in the 20%, when there is residual uh, pattern for, it's typically very, very low volume and, and not necessarily uh, uh, potentially lethal. But look, I think, you know, Nelson, what I think, hopefully I think is, 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 is one take home message that in selected patients, uh, focal therapy shouldn't be simply summarily dismissed because of multifocal disease. And, and I would say that uh, MRI coupled with fusion biopsy and systematic biopsy uh, is is pretty good at selecting patients. I would have to concede that the mapping biopsy uh, would be even better. And what it really represents is, you know, risk, uh, risk benefit. But I, I think you would agree that simply on the basis of the notion that prostate cancer is multifocal, that uh, focal therapy is a non-starter. But having said that, I think there is sort of a compelling uh, argument in its favor, but we have a lot of work to do in selection of patients, which I think this discussion uh, was about, and then how do we follow patients. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we, we, and Dave included, that the time is now to sort of walk the walk uh, and see where it leads us, but we have to be uh, thoughtful in doing this. Uh, great discussions. You know, I, I hearken back to years ago, I had patients say to me, Dr. Crawford, why do you have to take my whole prostate out? Can't you just treat part of it? Which uh, generated our interest in this uh, over a decade ago and um, started on this, uh, on this uh, 3D reconstruction and mapping, not the same thing that Neil's talking about now, but a little bit cruder. But there's no question that it 
added some detail and uh, and uh, uh, evaluation of the prostate that we didn't have any at, at, at that time. The uh, a, a couple of things I I mentioned to uh, Herb about Gleason eight cancers and higher grades. Uh, Neil, I guess I would disagree with you on your algorithm. If you have somebody that you find a Gleason eight, a small cancer, uh, on the mapping biopsies, that they don't necessarily need a radical prostatectomy. You know where it is. And I think they're good candidates for uh, targeted focal therapy. And, and Gary Onik actually did this a long time ago and had some pretty good results. The, the last, uh, last comment, I think we're sort of running out of time. Two things. If you look at the AUA news this month, uh, we're talking about what's the hot topics in the front page, focal therapy treatment of the future or today. And Another one was about transperineal biopsy. Are we moving the needle and talking about <laughs> moving that way? And I, I don't think that um, your targeted uh, MRI biopsies necessarily have to be done uh, transrectally, that there are programs now where you can do it transperineally. The, the last thing I want to ask you to comment on, both of you, is, is I've often said the hard part is finding these cancers whether it be with MRI or transperineal uh, uh, mapping biopsies, sort of the easy part is ablating them, but maybe it isn't. Uh, Herb, what do you use for ablation? What energy to use or what? And then I'll ask Neil the same question. Well, you know, I think, Dave, a lot depends uh, on the location of the tumor, the size uh, of, uh, of the gland. Uh, at, at our institution, sort of the workhorse is, is the focal cryo, uh, I would say we do probably three focal cryos to every focal HIFU. Um, you know, we've uh, investigated the photodynamic therapy, which is uh, uh, not approved. We have not done electroporation. Samir has done uh, the radio frequency. So, you know, one of the limitations of the HIFU uh, is one, the prostate volume, and two, anterior lesions. And I'd even say, uh, uh, the 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 fact that uh, it's not uh, um, uh, approved by uh, Medicare uh, and uh, and third party payers certainly from the the professional uh, fee. I think if you what 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 I have found is when we really do a focal HIFU with a let's say 10 millimeter margin when feasible that we have very virtually no. Um, uh, erectile dysfunction, you know, maybe we tackle a little bit bigger tumors with a cryo, but I just don't think it's as precise uh, in terms of the, the energy deliverance. Uh, so we probably do have some uh, extension outside of the capsule uh, and a bit more sexual dysfunction that we hope uh, will recover as we follow. Uh, patients longer. The other thing you worry about, right, with HIFU is it's every pulse of energy, and you wonder if we'll have more skip lesions uh, than we do with uh, with with cryo. But I think that urologists probably will have more versatility. It's easier to learn the the cryo, but I do believe that that HIFU in select cases uh, does add to our ability to offer focal therapy. Great, Neil. Yeah. Do you want to comment? Sure, and uh, I, I just want to make a bold statement here, and that is, and I think you two of you agree that in the future, whole gland therapy will be the exception, not the rule. So I think we're all in the same mindset. We're moving to a focal therapy paradigm for treating localized prostate cancer, and I agree with you, Dave, that Gleason 8 and above will fit into that paradigm depending on the size and the location. As far as treating with focal therapy, that's going to depend on a number of factors. It's going to depend on lesion number, lesion size, and lesion location. So if you have a fairly large lesion near the urethra, you're probably not going to want to use cryoablation because of the warming effect of, a, of the catheter in the urethra and the uh, chance that you may not ablate that tumor. Um, brachytherapy works very well. One of the things that urologists are going to need to have is some visual feedback. So if you have a representation, whether it comes from an MRI or it comes from 3D mapping software, where that lesion is in the prostate, and you want to have some visual feedback that your ablation zone surrounds that lesion, that representation of the lesion, then you need visual 
uh, feedback. Well, you get that with cryo. You get that with brachy because you can put the seeds in that area, and the mat can be uh, the brachytherapy software gives you the isodose clouds you can see around the lesion. You don't really get it so well with HIFU. You don't get it well with electroporation. You might be able to get it with convection therapy when that becomes available for prostate cancer. You can get it with laser, but you need thermography with a laser to be able to see the fields around it. So there is no one answer. There are many answers, and that's going to depend on the variables I just mentioned. You know, Dave, one real quick thing, and, and you hit on it. And, you know, you know the problem with the, even the Gleason, you know, categories. Here's the problem, right? You hit your – look, if you have a 2-millimeter lesion and all it has is 4, that's a Gleason 8. And you could have a 2-centimeter lesion that is 40% pattern 4, and that's a 3 plus 4. So, you know, I, I think what happens is is you have to bring some common sense. And I think we sweepingly talk about, well, this is an aggressive cancer, uh, and, you know, we can't treat Gleason's 8. But the good thing, right, Dave uh, and Nelson, common sense uh, uh, ultimately uh, is going to help uh, in, in, in getting this right. Yeah, and they, you know, the other thing is, uh, it, it, it's all about identifying the lesion. No one mentioned immunotherapy, but uh, there's a lot of work going on with immunological approaches, and we could be directing those right to these lesions. Um, as you know, you don't need your prostate, so if you have, you got lots of antigens, you can go after PSMA, PSA, and various other things, acid phosphatase. And um, you target that with some in, immunological approach where you can't do that with liver very much so, and you can't do it with lung because you need your lung and liver. And knowing where these things are and targeting, and I think also it's going to uh, play out in the future. So, you know, I, this was an out, absolutely outstanding presentations and discussions. And on behalf of Grand Rounds and Neurology, I want to thank both of you for uh, spending your time. You won't find anything like this uh, at meetings, I can tell you right now, because uh, I've been to a lot of them where this kind of discussion in detail went on. And uh, again, guys, thanks a lot and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, thanks for Thank the you. opportunity, Dave.